Here you go, hiding in the back of the church again. <laughs> we'll wait for the bells and then we'll begin. So at the 6 o'clock service, we declared this, the back row, and said, everybody, come on up. But we're not going to do that to you this morning, so. <laughs> because we're trying to get organized, and we've got a lot going on. Uh, did you get one of these little things? Did it fall out into your hand? <laughs> because what we'd like you to do is just take a moment, sometime during our worship today, to jot down things that you're thankful for. It might be that God's in control of the world. It might be for uh, somebody special in your life. It might be for your dog. <laughs> the whole range of things. So what we're going to do is print these, everybody's, for our, our worship bulletin and Thanksgiving weekend, the Thanksgiving services and the, the following weekend. So if you can drop these into the offering plate, if you get done with it by that time, it's okay if you've got a long list to write in the backside as well. But <laughs> or drop them off at, at the desk out there in one of the boxes, and we'll make sure they, they get passed on. Uh, as we gather for worship today, just to, we're going to get done by 9.30 sharp because we need to get ready for 11 o'clock service. So if I turn to Josh at some point and say, the end. <laughs> <laughs> but we are going to be talking about the end today based on today's gospel lesson, which is from Mark chapter 13 where Jesus addresses signs of the end with a, a lot more detail than what most of us are comfortable with. And so I want to read to you, uh, I guess we're, we're going to be standing for the first song anyway, so let's stand for this portion of the gospel lesson from Mark chapter 13. I don't know if that's on our slides for today or not. If not, that's fine. Uh, verses 5 through 8. Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray, because many are going to come in my name saying, I am he, you know, false messiahs. And they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. But in those days, after that tribulation, and here's the sign of the end, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken and then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. The days of Elijah, the last times of pronouncing the truth of God's love and grace are on us. Gosh, wherever you are. Lead us on. Good morning and welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church. We're very glad to have you with us this morning. Got a little feedback there, sorry. Uh, for those of you that we can see anyway. Um, apparently the acoustic set last week sounded really great but didn't look so good, so we're relegated back here in the corner. But we, we miss seeing about three quarters of y'all. But nonetheless, we invite you to sing this next tune, Days of Elijah, with us. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, of righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sore, we are the voice in the desert crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. Rock the trumpet, call, lift your voice, it's here to lead, out of Zion till salvation comes. Declaring the word of the Lord Behold he comes 
God like Jehovah. There's no 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 God like Jehovah. And all he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice to hear a jubilee. Out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Worship service is a democracy, and it's best when it is. Uh, please continue standing as we sing your graces and up. <laughs> Is enough for me. 
scripture reading for today comes from Hebrews chapter 10. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But then Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins. He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single suffering he was perfected for all time, those who were being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. <laughs> Seem to have stuck together. Where there is no forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin, the full assurance of faith. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our, our Savior and his blood sacrifice for us as his people, we profess our faith publicly using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We have this marvelous privilege of calling on the name of the Lord. Josh. This, uh, this tune is call and response, and you may be seated as we continue to sing. Uh, traditionally, the men call and the women respond, but I thought we'd switch that around. So if you're familiar with I Will Call Upon the Lord, the ladies sing the first line and the gentlemen respond. We'll come back to that and go right into the announcements. So, yeah, back up to the first of the announcements, please. So I saw what's on the menu for the Lutheran Hour Ministries reception. <laughs> You'll want to hang around or come back at 1215 
it's going to be a, a great time to meet Pastor Seltz. One, one other fascinating little tidbit. Some of you grew up in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, and you know how we kind of know people from all over the country. It was really neat at the uh, regional outreach conference on Friday night when Eric Havens walked up to Pastor Greg Seltz, and Pastor Seltz turned around, and it took him a second because it's been a few years, and then he broke out in this big smile because Eric Havens and Greg Seltz were sweet mates up at Concordia Junior College in Ann Arbor many years ago. Anyway, we get to celebrate and welcome a friend of the congregation, Greg Seltz, as our preacher at the next service and reception after that, and that's why you got all the equipment in here right now. Um, senior pastor call process, focus groups right after church. In fact, we're going to do a, a good job of getting done at a reasonable time so that you'll actually have time to do that if you want to stay for Pastor Seltz. Uh, the survey that some of you have filled out is online or you can get a paper copy. But the focus groups are so that you get a chance to talk personally with a couple people from the call committee and they get a feel for what Trinity is looking for in its next senior pastor. And then copies of the nominations form, if you have a person in mind who might qualify to serve as their next senior pastor, you find those out in the, uh, the rack, literature rack area out there. What else do we have? So, yeah, already getting ready for 2016 kindergarten with the kindergarten roundup. We have it up there for all of you so you can spread the word around the neighborhood that it's a great place to send our kids for uh, kindergarten. And then leading into Thanksgiving week, right before the 6 o'clock service this coming Saturday, we'll have prayer service, prayers of Thanksgiving, prayers for healing, whatever else is on people's minds, kind of informal. And then all the great stuff that happens Thanksgiving next week actually heard that there will be food after the 9.30 service already. Now, if you want the big thing, you know, come later, but uh, we're going to celebrate all weekend and welcome our new members and staff appreciation at that Thanksgiving dinner as well. Now, how many of you can see that it says December 4th? The rest of you, there's an optom optometrist waiting at the back door. <laughs> Yeah, it, we're less than three weeks away from the tree lighting and uh, the, the gift and all of that and the putting up the star the Wednesday before that on December 2nd. So please mark that on, on your calendar. And now, before we get into God's Word, I want to ask you to stand up and see who you're worshiping with today. And if you spot somebody that you don't recognize, here's the, qu the question to you. So how long have you been coming here? All right, go for it. Share the peace. Get acquainted. Jesus comes back, prefer for Jesus coming, I think we'll all be standing, but right now you can sit down because we're going to dig into God's Word. And to do this, you may want to have your Bible open to Mark chapter 13. I read a few verses, but we're going to work our way through that whole chapter. It's on page 849 in your pew Bible, 849, Mark chapter 13. And it's got some stuff in it that a lot of people get confused about. So I want to read to you two verses that set the theme, and then, then we'll start finding our way through it. Jesus was leaving the temple. So this is the last week of, of his life here on earth. And he said to his disciples, looking at the temple, not a single stone here will be left in its place. And the disciples said, tell us, when will this be? What will happen to show us? that the time has come for all these things to take place. The words that I'm using are from a little different translation. In some points, a little easier to understand, but you'll be able to follow along with the Pew Bible as well. What makes Mark 13 confusing for a lot of folks is that Jesus runs together two kinds of signs. One is about the, this temple being torn down, not one stone on top of another. But later in the chapter, he's talking about the end of the world. 
which in the disciples' mind might have been one and the same thing. Maybe Jesus is coming back when the temple is destroyed. But us, with hindsight, understand that the temple was destroyed only about 40 years after Jesus left planet Earth, 70 A.D. Now, in Matthew's Gospel, you get a, a little more detail of the question the disciples were asking, and they were really asking both things. Tell us when the temple will be destroyed and what will happen to show that it is time for your coming and the end of the age. Forty years to the destruction of the temple, but here it is 2,000 years later, and we're still waiting for the end of the world. The disciples had no clue that those were separate things. They saw them all as one. Jesus is talking about signs for both of them, and then he adds this other layer of things I call preliminary warnings. He says they're like the first pains of childbirth. So how many of you have ever experienced the pains of childbirth. Mike, come on. <laughs> okay, so some of us are never well, vicariously, right? What is it when, what's the official term for false labor? Anybody remember? Braxton Hicks contractions, right? I think that's what Jesus is talking about here, the first signs. Yeah, there's a baby, it's gonna come out, but this is, this is not the real thing yet. This is just the warning that it's coming. First signs of, of childbirth. And Jesus says, don't be fooled by those preliminary signs. Many men claiming to speak for me are going to come and say, I am he. All you know, these false messiahs that have happened throughout the generations. And they will fool many people. I was alive when Jim Jones took his group down to British Guiana. Just weird stuff. Jesus says, don't be troubled. When you hear... News of battles far away, noise of battles close by. Don't be troubled by explosions in Paris. Wow. Such things must happen, but they don't mean that the end has come. Countries will fight each other, Jesus says. Kingdoms will attack one. There are greedy people in this world who want to take stuff away from other people, and there will be natural disasters. He says there will be earthquakes everywhere, there will be famines. Around here, I heard about how you get ready for hurricanes, and out in the Midwest, you don't know how to get ready for tornadoes, and over in Japan, well, how do you prepare for a tsunami? Jesus says, that kind of stuff. It's like the first pains of childbirth. And what he's saying is all those natural disasters and all the sinful fighting that goes on in the world, it's evidence that God will not let this world keep on going forever the way it is. He is going to bring it to an end, but you need to know the most important sign. And it's not complicated. Before the end comes, the gospel must be preached to all peoples. Oh, <laughs> that makes sense, doesn't it? God wants everybody to have a chance to be... Well, years later, Peter got this all sorted out. And so in his second letter, chapter 3 of, of 2 Peter, he writes, The Lord's not slow to do what he's promised. A thousand years there is a day, days is a thousand years, it's been 2,000 years, it's only two days in God's time. What's going on? He is patient with you because he does not want anyone to be destroyed. He's letting this world go on the way it is because he wants the gospel to get out to all people. He wants all people to turn away from their sins. So if everybody discovered Jesus was their Savior, God could say, okay, done with it. <laughs> Let's go back to paradise. That's why what we're talking about this weekend with Pastor Seltz, Lutheran Hour Ministries, is so important. I heard over the weekend that Lutheran Hour on any given weekend reaches 51 million people. And I don't know how you measure that exactly, but you're telling us about how in Indonesia they have indigenous preachers. So it's not Greg Seltz's voice being Google translated into whatever they speak in Indonesia, but 51 million people. And I say that's pretty impressive. And so I started doing the math. Some of you might want to check me out here. 51 million compared to 7 plus billion in the world, 0.7%. Hearing the gospel that way. There's a lot more gospel preaching and needs to be done by all kinds of people to get the word out. And telling the gospel can be pretty dangerous business because sometimes people don't want to be told you're a sinner who needs a savior. They want their own kind of religion. 
And so Jesus says, I got to tell you, you don't need to be afraid of persecution. It's going to come. Watch out. You will be arrested and taken to court. You will stand before rulers and kings to tell them the good news. But when you're arrested, do not worry. Oh, really? Do not worry about what you're going to say. The words you speak will not be yours. They will come from the Holy Spirit. If you're on trial because you're telling people about God, Jesus says, I'll send the Spirit. Words will come out. They won't be yours. They'll be mine. So the point of all of this is, no matter what's going on around us, keep your eyes focused on Jesus. He will take you safely through it. Endure to the end. Next point in the outline. Whoever endures to the end will be saved. Some people have said that about sermons. This is going to be a shorter one this morning, so enduring to the end. Well, okay. There's another point in the Bible where that same point is made by the longest living of the apostles. His name is John, and he wrote the last book of the Bible, which is what? Revelation. And you've probably read it and all the strange symbolic stuff that's in there, but right in the middle of it, Jesus says, John, this is what you need to write down. This calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Jesus saying, yeah, just hang in there with me. It'll be okay. Well, in America today, we've been blessed with the pretty wide latitude to share the gospel. No guarantees it's going to be that way forever, right? We can feel it kind of shrinking in around us in this past generation. Jesus is warning us when the day comes that it's hard to share the gospel and it's not a popular thing to do. Keep on going. Endure. You will be saved. Next April 16th, we get to host a conference on persecuted Jews and Christians. Reverend Bruce Leesky, because it's a real problem. Jesus says, but endure to the end, and you will be saved. After saying all that to the disciples about how sharing the gospel is going to be tough, he switches gears and starts talking about preparing for the destruction of the temple. What are the signs? This is a strange one. You will see the, what do we have up there? Uh, we missed that verse in, in the PowerPoint. You will see the awful horror the simpler translation. Some of you may remember the term from the old King James, the abomination of desolation. What in the world is that? The abom it was like the worst imaginable, right? Abomination of desolation. And then Mark says, let the reader understand. If you've got your Bible open, that will tell you that this is not some mystery that you can't interpret. It's something that the people back then would get. And what they got was back in 168 B.C., so a little over a century and a half before Jesus was born, a king from the north, from up in Syria, country right to the north of Palestine, Antiochus Epiphanes, brought his army down to Jerusalem and took a pig, unclean animals, the most unsavory thing a Jew could imagine, and sacrificed it on the altar in the temple. He was mocking God. The abomination. Desolation. Where is the worship of God when a pig is being slaughtered on the altar? So, Jesus is saying, watch for that awful horror to happen again. Somebody mocking God. Well, it happened in 68 AD. And once you know this piece of history, a lot of things will fall in place here. In 68 AD, there was a group of Jewish zealots. They were a political party with, among the Jews. And they mocked God by naming a clown, a real live clown by the name of Fani, as the high priest. What a mockery of God to declare that the high priest is a clown. Two years later, God allows the Roman armies to come into Jerusalem and level the place, not one stone on top of another at the temple. When you know that, some of these other things make sense. Those who are in Judea must run away to the hills. Well, the Roman army's coming. You want to escape? Get into the hills where they can't get you. But how terrible it will be for women who are pregnant and for mothers with little children. Does God have something against moms? No. The point is, if you have to run from the Roman army and you're escaping into the mountains, 
It's going to be tough if you've got toddlers coming along with you. Pray that these things will not happen in winter. I don't think it was snow. As I've researched it, rain, rainy season. And, and so it's treacherous climbing the mountains with your kids when things are awful outside. So how do you prepare? Trust in Jesus. And, and beautiful little gospel phrases here. Know that the Lord has already reduced the number of those days. He looked at his eternal time clock and said, I don't think my people can hang on that long. I'm going to make it a shorter duration of suffering. Pure grace. And second thing he says, be on guard because I've told you everything ahead of time. When you know that somebody's controlling it, you feel better about being able to deal with the pain for a while. And so Jesus is saying, trust me. I'll shrink the amount of time. I know it's going to turn out okay in the end. Apostle Paul discovered that. I can endure all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now Jesus shifts from the destruction of the temple to the end of the world, and the disciples didn't know how to sort it out. We can tell the difference because we know that the temple fell in 70 A.D. Jesus says, I told you about persecutions, I told you about the temple, but here's what you need to know about the end. The sun will grow dark. The moon will no longer shine. Will you read that and say, that could be a solar eclipse, that could be a lunar eclipse. Hard for them to both happen at the same time. The stars will fall from the heavens. The stars would be the suns of, of galaxies all over the universe. And when they start falling out of the sky, you know that the universe as we know it is not going to survive. The powers in space driven from their courses, and Jesus says the Son of Man, he's pointing to himself, will appear coming in clouds with great power and glory. But not to worry. He will send the angels out to the four corners of the earth to gather God's chosen people. You'll know when it's happening, and you'll be safe because angels will be wrapping you in their arms, bringing you home. Last point in this uh, section is don't worry about the exact time that it's going to happen. Jesus says no one knows when that day or hour will come. Angels in heaven don't know it. I don't know it down here as a human. Only the Father knows. So when was the last time somebody predicted the end of the world? You hear it every once in a while. I've heard it a number of times in my lifetime. I think it was 2012 when the Mayan calendar ran out. They said, oh, that must be the end of the world. There's no more calendar running down there. So. I personally believe that if somebody's predicted a certain day, it won't be that day. Because the Bible says only God knows. That's all God's business. Jesus' point to us is, don't worry about the end. What I say to you, I say to everybody, stay awake. And he's not just talking about keeping your eyes open during a sermon. He's saying, keep watch over your heart. And I love that Peter is the one asking the question, what are the signs of your coming? When is this all going to happen? Because Peter, who is told to watch, is the same guy who hours later, days later, fell asleep when Jesus said, can you just watch with me one hour and pray here in the Garden of Gethsemane? And later that night, Peter's the one who couldn't guard his own heart when he's sitting by the charcoal fire and Jesus is on trial and three times he denies knowing Jesus. No surprise that many years later, Peter says, be sober, be vigilant for your adversary, the devil, is roaming around like a lion looking for... He, he lived it. But to us, he says, since all these things will be destroyed in this way, since the end really is coming someday, what kind of people should you be? Your lives should be holy, dedicated to God. Holy literally means just consecrated, set apart. Keep watch over your heart that sin is not gaining control over you. Keep watch over your heart that Satan isn't leading you astray. Don't worry about the end. But, as Peter says, as you wait for the day of God, listen to this, do your best to make it come. So we have a say in making the end come sooner? God determines the day, but God actually gives us a part to play in it. Before the end comes, the gospel must be preached to all peoples. Who's going to preach the gospel? God has appointed people, me, you, 
to do that, whether it's Greg Seltz, so over 51 million people, or, or whether it's pastors and congregations, or whether it's you walking out of here and talking to somebody that you know about, you know God loves you? There's a Savior. Your life is in shambles. Jesus is saying, come to me. When the gospel has been proclaimed to all people throughout the world as a testimony to all nations, then the end will come. To put that in a little stronger language than what the Bible does, the end of the world doesn't come soon. We've all got only ourselves to blame, right? <laughs> Didn't need to take 2,000 years. We could have gotten the gospel out to all people sooner than that, but God knows how all that's going to play out, so our job is just open our mouths when God gives us an opportunity to share something of the faith, of the hope that is within us. And Peter <laughs> takes it to the last step that the best is yet to come. We wait for the day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed. Why? Well, we're waiting for what God has promised, new heavens and a new earth where righteousness will be at home. Everything that was beautiful about the Garden of Eden God wants to restore it. And when everybody's had a chance to put their trust in Jesus, then God will say, okay, it's time. For people who had questions about how it's going to work, in John chapter 14, Jesus says, let me put it in simple language. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Forget the timing issue. Forget the where it is. Forget what it looks like. Just know, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and when I get that place prepared for you, I'm coming back and I will take you to where I am so that we all can be together in the Father's presence. Thomas wasn't quite satisfied. Do you remember that day? Always had another question. Did any of you have kids like that? Always another question? <laughs> so I, I respect Thomas because you know, he just puts it right out. Jesus, you know, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way to get there? Jesus says, let me make it simple for you, Thomas. I am the way. <laughs> I am the truth. I am the life. No one goes to the Father except by me. So the bottom line of this whole chapter, Mark chapter 13 and then John 14, is trust Jesus. He'll get us there. He says, don't worry about the timing. Don't be looking at your watch to see whether it's the last hour. Don't be looking in the sky to see whether Jesus is up there right now. Be looking in your heart, right? Is Jesus there as your Savior, as your Lord? Because he's the one who died on the cross and rose again. He's the one who ascended to heaven and is preparing a place for us now. He's the one that says, I'm giving you the privilege of telling other people about me. And he's the one that says, trust me, I will come and take you home. So the end of this message is pretty simple. Thank you, Jesus. We do trust you, and we love you. Amen. We're going to gather offerings now, and while we do that, we've got this marvelous little chorus to sing about Jesus. As we see what's happening in the world around us, we remember that we do trust Christ our Lord. And though kings and kingdoms pass away, the, Lord, the name of the Lord is eternal and will remain eternally. And so as we sing this chorus, we remember that uh, that Christ came to bring God's kingdom as man's dominion is not as eternal as his lasting name. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like a fragrance after the
once more. Let's sing. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. God is all about. And as you look down upon this earth of yours, the sin that contaminates it, the disasters that you allow to shake it, remind us that the end must come, but the gospel must be preached first. And so we pray today that where sin abounds, gospel preaching, whether it's one person telling another, or whether it's a broadcast or a new church being formed in Indonesia, the gospel will be preached. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, you've carved out this little space for us at Ruth Lane in Livingston and said, let the light shine. And so we ask you that we'll see clearly how to be faithful to the task of spreading the gospel to our neighbors up and down the street, our friends where we live, our co-workers wherever we are, so that hearts may be warmed by your gracious love. Lord, in your mercy, in our special petitions this morning. Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with Greg and Susan this week. Give them peace during the trial. And Father, we also ask you to be with Michelle. We ask you to Go to her, be with her, send her your message for her future. And Father, we pray for all travelers this, this coming week, but particularly for Ryan and Kristen as they travel in Italy. We ask them safe passage and safe time there. Father, bless all these that given us these prayers. And Lord, thank you for, for Trinity and thank you for what we learned here this morning. And we ask, ask you to send us out this week with that message. And Father, thank you for Pastor Martin and we ask you his safety and uh, blessings in his ministry here. And Lord, he's, uh, Lord, in your mercy. Dear Lord Jesus, these prayers and all the other ones that are on our hearts this morning, we lay before your throne of grace as we pray in the words that you taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And dear Lord Jesus, as we pray those words, they just remind us through and through of how far short we fall from your holiness, your glory, using your name the way it was intended, hallowing it moment by moment in prayer, seeing your kingdom come, doing our part to let the kingdom come in our hearts and in our lives, so many ways that we fall short, trusting you for daily bread, remembering to say I'm sorry when, when we don't do it right, falling prey to the evil one. And so we confess to you, based on this Lord's prayer, that we are still sinners in need of a Savior. 
And I ask you, Lord, as does each person here, please accept my confession. Please offer me assurance of your forgiveness. In Jesus' name. In the words of absolution that come from God through us today, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And our Lord Jesus wants to personalize that for every one of us, and we recall how he did that with his disciples on the night when he was betrayed. We see how he's doing it for us again today. He took the bread in that Passover meal and gave thanks to God for it, broke the bread, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper that night, he took the cup and gave thanks to God and then said, Take and drink, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so our Lord Jesus is inviting you, arms outstretched, come to my table, receive my body, receive the blood that I shed for you. Be assured that I forgive you and that I desire to live in you and through you. Amen. You may be seated.
you were here before the world began above all kingdoms above all thrones above all we wonders the world has ever known above all wealth and treasures of the the fall that was mine, crucified for my sins, for the sins of the world. You showed us that you thought of every one of us above all else in this world. What an awesome privilege to be called children of God, brothers and sisters of you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. We are so grateful. And we desire to pass along the blessings that you pour into our hearts to many other lives as well. So guide us in being a blessing to the world around us. We pray in your holy name. Amen. And I want to invite you to join with me in the words of the benediction, but before we do that, thankful. If you didn't finish it up, drop it off on the way out. And I was thinking about just standing at the back door and blocking so that you'd go right over to the middle loggia rooms where, uh, middle loggia room, where somebody, a couple people probably from our senior pastor call team are, because they would love to hear personally, not just the uh, survey uh, results, but what you're thinking about what God has in store for us or what you would like to see in our next senior pastor here. So please head over that direction and and share, because it's our opportunity to talk personally with the call committee. So with that, uh, let's stand and let's raise our hands and let's pass on the blessing of the Lord. May the Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. See you.
and serve the Lord.